Good evening. Welcome to Prescription for Justice. My name is Martin Donahue, and I'm your host. The history of war begins approximately 10,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture and the subsequent development of non-migratory populations, the division of labor, and the development of class structures, specifically the rise of a warrior class supported by these populations' leadership and their citizens as a means of further enrichment and protection. Over time, weapons became increasingly sophisticated. Bronze weapons and armor were developed 3,500 years ago, iron weapons 2,200 years ago, and the widespread use of horses to facilitate battles farther afield from home 1,900 years ago. Bombs were invented in the 9th century and rockets in the 13th century, although they were not employed until the 19th century. In 1783, the Montgolfier brothers invented the hot air balloon, which was soon used for reconnaissance and to drop bombs. In 1903, the Wright brothers ushered in the airplane age at Kitty Hawk, and now, in the 20th century, we have all manner of destructive weapons at our disposal, including guns that can shoot multiple rounds per second, tanks, predator drones, and soon, robotic soldiers. There were approximately 250 wars in the 20th century, and the epidemiology of warfare has evolved dramatically over the last 100 plus years. While only 10 to 15 percent of direct casualties of war through the late 19th century were among civilians, today civilians represent 85 to 90 percent of casualties, the product of increasingly sophisticated weapons that can kill at greater distances. A massive legal and illegal arms market supports these wars, most of which involve the use of U.S. produced and or supplied weapons. Consequences of warfare include deaths, injuries, physical and psychological suffering, refugees, internally displaced persons, environmental degradation, famine, collapse of healthcare systems affecting those with acute and chronic illness, increasing poverty and debt, and in turn, recurrent cycles of violence. The most feared agents of military destruction are chemical and biological weapons, which have been used for millennia, but which today can be weaponized to kill and sicken massive numbers of people, and nuclear weapons. The 1972 Biological and Toxic Weapons Convention prohibits the development, production, and maintenance of chemical weapons, and the U.S. and Russia have been gradually destroying their significant stockpiles. Similarly, the 1972 Biological Weapons Protocol calls for the elimination of such weapons, but enforcement has been lax and needs to be accelerated. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped a 15-kiloton bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, ultimately leading to 140,000 deaths. Buckminster Fuller called this the day that humanity started taking its final exam. Three days later, we dropped a 22 kiloton bomb on Nagasaki, leading to 70,000 casualties. Both bombings left many survivors with burns, cancers, and other chronic health problems. Modern weapons are much stronger, their explosive power measured in megatons. Since the 1940s, there have been 1,054 U.S. nuclear tests, 80,000 U.S. citizens have developed cancers, 15,000 of them fatal, due to radioactive fallout from atmospheric testing. Today, there are approximately 15,000 nuclear weapons in at least nine countries, down from 71,000 at the height of the Cold War. There are a combined 4,300 active U.S. and Russian warheads today, 1,800 on hair trigger alert which means they can be launched and reach their targets in less than 30 minutes. The world's aggregate nuclear explosive power is several thousand megatons, or 100,000 Hiroshimas, and its arsenal vastly redundant. Even so, the U.S. is planning to spend $1 trillion on new nuclear weapons and delivery systems over the next few decades. The Pentagon has acknowledged 20, 32 nuclear weapons accidents since 1950 while the Bipartisan Government Accountability Office has counted 233. Some of these have resulted in near launches, averted by quick thinking and lots of luck. Since 1950, 10 nuclear bombs have been lost and never recovered. All are laying on the seabed, potentially leaking radioactivity. In the event of a nuclear explosion, immediate victims would be vaporized by thermal radiation, crushed by a powerful blast wave, and burned and suffocated by a massive firestorm. Later victims would suffer slower, painful deaths. A more specific description of the consequences of the explosion of just one nuclear missile is as follows. 
From ground zero to two miles, within one one hundredth of a second, a fireball hotter than the sun would vaporize everything in its path. From two to four miles out, enormous pressures and 650 mile per hour winds would rip apart and level buildings. From four to 10 miles out, high heat and 200 mile per hour winds would melt sheet metal. Concrete buildings would be heavily damaged and all other structures leveled. 10 to 16 miles from the epicenter, a 2,500 degree Fahrenheit firestorm would produce 100% mortality. From 16 to 21 miles out, Glass would shatter and debris fly wildly about. At 21 to 29 miles from the epicenter, humans would receive third degree burns over all exposed skin. From 29 to 40 miles out, all who witnessed the explosion would be immediately blinded. Other types of injuries expected include deafness, collapsed lungs, fractures, hemorrhage, and eviscerations from shrapnel wounds and radiation sickness. Those exposed to very high amounts of radiation would suffer brain swelling, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, speech and gait difficulties, convulsions, and then coma followed by death within one to two days. Exposure to medium doses would cause nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. These symptoms would resolve only to be followed three days later by recurrent bloody nausea and diarrhea which would kill most victims. Lower doses would cause bone marrow failure, infections, bleeding, open sores, and a somewhat slower death. Almost all healthcare personnel would be killed or fatally wounded and most major hospitals destroyed. What few healthcare personnel and resources that remained after a nuclear weapons explosion would be overwhelmed. There would be few, if any, working ambulances, x-ray machines, antibiotics or other medications, blood, plasma, or even bandages, let alone electricity or clean water. Other consequences of a nuclear war would include devastation of transportation systems and water and power infrastructures, the breakdown of national and international governments, and large numbers of displaced, wandering, starving persons suffering from psychological trauma and facing significant risks of later cancers. A massive nuclear exchange would cause the earth to cool and the resulting decades-long nuclear winter lead to mass starvation secondary to worldwide crop failures. If a typical nuclear warhead exploded over my home city of Portland, Oregon, most citizens of the metropolis and its surrounding suburbs would be dead within one month, with the survivors roaming a post-apocalyptic hellscape likely wishing for a quick death. To prevent such massive destruction, there is only one real solution, the abolition of nuclear weapons and safe storage and destruction of all nuclear materials to prevent them from getting into the hands of terrorists or being used by any future governments. The International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, winner of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize, has taken the first step toward doing this with the recent adoption by a majority of the world's nations of the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which will become effective when 50 of the adopting 135 nations formally sign the treaty. The U.S. and other nations possessing nuclear weapons have not adopted the treaty. In the meantime, Congress should take all our nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. The decision to launch a nuclear weapon should not lie with just one individual, regardless of his or her party affiliation. Although certainly given the current president's unstable temperament, the risks of launch are higher than they have ever been. While it might seem impossible for the world to rid itself of nuclear weapons, citizen activism to encourage universal adoption of this treaty is absolutely necessary to achieve the dream of a much safer world free of nuclear weapons for ourselves and for future generations. Our guest today is Chuck Johnson, Nuclear Power Program Director at Oregon Physicians for Social Responsibility, the local chapter of National Physicians for Social Responsibility, which is in turn the U.S. Representative of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, winner of the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize, and a member of the steering committee for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. He will soon be moving to Boston to become Program Director for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Chuck, <laughs> it's a great pleasure to have you here and welcome. No, it's great to be here, thank you. Please tell us about this treaty and how it's different from other attempts to ban nuclear weapons. Well, the approach on this treaty is, is the total abolition of nuclear weapons based on the humanitarian excuse me, humanitarian consequences of using those weapons, which you outlined so vividly in your introduction. Um, previous attempts to limit nuclear weapons have uh, 
uh, been more uh, based upon strategic considerations, uh, discussing numerical totals of weapons, and have uh, bogged down, I think, in, in uh, the negotiations between countries that uh, have, have lost sight of what these weapons actually are and what they mm -hmm. actually do. Um, these, these weapons are unusable, uh, you know, in, in for any uh, human, humanly uh, oriented foreign policy mm -hmm. purpose. And in fact, if they were used, would uh, cause more damage to the user than would be uh, acceptable under any circumstances. Certainly. Uh, with the open hostility of the U.S., Great Britain, and France, and no participation at this point of the nuclear weapon states and their closest allies, is this an exercise in futility? And maybe you could also tell us about that opposition and how it's manifest itself. Okay. Uh, just to, to go back to the humanitarian uh, uh, underpinnings here, the, the one thing that's similar about this treaty approach, uh, as opposed to some others, is that it's uh, taking the same approach that the Biological Weapons Treaty took and the Chemical Weapons Treaty took, uh, the treaty to ma ban landmines as well, uh, in that it it attempts to uh, set a world standard of uh, establishing certain weapons as being uh, against uh, civilians of not being legal weapons to use in warfare and stigmatizes them. And over time, these other weapon systems have become limited to the point uh, where very few nations possess them. In the case of chemical weapons, there's really very few at all at this point. And occasionally, a country does use them, such as Syria was accused recently, and, uh, and suffers intense consequences internationally as a result. Right, both economic and in terms of their reputation. So exactly. really uh, sort of pouring a program on those countries that violate this, this international norm. And, um, and the also, the, if you look at the uh, Landmines Treaty, um, at this point, it's almost fully in force. There's only a few countries, including the United States and North Korea, that haven't signed it. Mm -hmm. But at this point, uh, landmines are not being, new landmines are not being uh, produced or, uh, or, or used around the world. And in fact, there are intensive campaigns to uh, find and uh, defuse landmines throughout the world. And, and this, that particular scourge will be, uh, you know, the, the end point is in sight on it. With nuclear weapons, it's a much more difficult task, but uh, it was felt by, by uh, the people who started uh, this, this treaty uh, negotiation 10 years ago, or began urging for that negotiation, that uh, this type of approach was needed. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit specifically about what the U.S. and Great Britain and France did at, at, at I think, the time of the Nobel Prize was announced. No, this was actually it was during the uh, during the negotiation mm -hmm. in uh, in New York. Um, they found uh, the the nuclear weapon states found themselves in the unusual position of of being uh, protesters at uh, at a UN conference that was being attended by 135 countries, um, and they set up uh, uh, podiums outside the uh, UN meeting room and uh, indicated that that they felt that this was a, a misguided approach being done by the UN, and, but, but it, 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 it was more from a point of weakness, more along the lines of what activists, sort of a role reversal with what the, the position that activists usually find themselves right. in. Right, and, and now the activists are winning clearly on, right. on this very long-term project that, that I know you and so many groups around the world are passionate about. Tell us about some of those groups that came together in ICANN. Well, um, the, uh, I think it was one of the most influential groups were the Hibakusha uh, groups from, from Japan. In fact, Setsuko Thurlow is, is, is uh, given uh, enormous credit, a uh, Canadian uh, survivor of the Hiroshima uh, blast who uh, gave a very impassioned speech during the uh, meeting uh, that uh, kept, kept the, the uh, the impetus and the fire going for uh, for the conclusion of this treaty and, and for keeping it strong. There were attempts to water it down. Uh, the the Netherlands did participate in this treaty, and they're they're one they're the one NATO ally that participated, mm -hmm. and um, and they suggested some amendments that would uh, weaken it. There were other uh, uh, amendments to weaken the uh, treaty, but it it passed in its original strong form. And there were a number of NGOs that came together on this too. I understand. Oh yes, 
Uh, mm -hmm. There were uh, thousands of NGOs that uh, that signed on on for it, and dozens of them that that sent representatives that were lobbying for it. And certainly, power in numbers, right? Um, what is the U.S. argument as to why this treaty is not nece not necessary? Does it relate to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? To they yeah, they believe that they uh, they they claim that that this will weaken the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and which they have been using, which we have been using, and and uh, which the world has been relying on for uh, to contain the uh, number of states that have nuclear weapons. And in the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty is a clause that says that the nuclear weapon states, there are five that were originally, uh, that had nuclear weapons mm -hmm. when that treaty went into force, the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, which is now uh, devolved to Russia, mm -hmm. um, the United Kingdom, France, and China, mm -hmm. um, were, uh, were to be working toward going to zero, but, but it was very a very vague, uh, part of that treaty, no specific timelines or deadlines for mm. it. And since that time, an additional four nations have become nuclear weapon states. Actually five, if you count uh, the uh, South African government, which uh, actually possessed nuclear weapons at one time, but then when they went to majority rule, they, they actually uh, destroyed their nuclear weapons uh -huh. and their nuclear weapons capability. Right, and there are other countries that have given up nuclear weapons programs in the past too. That's right. Uh, and f decided that they will forego the use of these weapons of mass destruction. There's quite a few, actually. Um, the uh, both Kazakhstan and Ukraine had nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union broke up, but they uh, decided to become nuclear-free states and mm -hmm. gave their weapons to Russia, mm -hmm. uh, and which made made the uh, uh, you know, made it a little bit less complicated, made the world, the geopolitical world a little less complicated with two less nuclear weapon states. And then you had Brazil and Argentina, which had nuclear right. weapons programs, but then uh, when their juntas were overthrown, they, both, both countries uh, ended those programs. Right, right. Uh, what's certainly frightening, and this, this might be the topic for another program, is the amount of nuclear material, though, that still remains unguarded in uh, Russia and elsewhere, and the threat of terrorists acquir acquiring such a weapon. And we've certainly seen um, other states develop nuclear weapons, like India and Pakistan, and, and now uh, potentially North Korea. Well, North Korea definitely, and mm -hmm. also Israel. Right, are and Israel. The other, are the other right. four states that right. have nuclear weapons. Uh, and so what about the argument that, hey, this is just all Pie in the sky dreams. This can never happen. Uh, uh, these are our enemies. Um, it's just not going to work. That is the U.S. argument, and it's it's not completely irrational. Uh, if if this treaty were the only thing that happened, then we wouldn't get disarmament. But within this treaty is also the understanding that uh, once this weapon has become completely stigmatized and no longer considered legitimate. Um, then the pressure will be on those states that possess nuclear weapons to develop their treaties, whatever they may be. In the case of, as I said earlier, Brazil and Argentina, uh, there was a Treaty of Tlatelolco that was the Latin American Nuclear Free Zone Treaty, mm -hmm. and they uh, signed on to that. That was, that was the method by which they became officially uh, not nuclear weapon states. Right. So you can do it either through a local nuclear free zone treaty or as the United States and the Soviet Union did and then now the United States and Russia have done uh, in reducing nuclear weapons, not eliminating unfortunately, right. but um, it's through mutual uh, agreement and then verification um, regimes. And, and those, are the th those would have to be done. With the countries that have possess nuclear weapons, you'd have to have some way of verifying that they're doing what they're saying. Certainly, they're doing. certainly. And uh, geopolitical <coughs> relationships change so much over time. Uh, just imagine it, now very strong allies, Japan and Germany, were our staunch enemies in World War II. That's right. And so uh, the, um, the use of diplomacy has worked. Right. Um, and in fact, in this case, it, it has to work. Um, it literally has to work because there is no other solution yeah. uh, or uh, we will have failed that, that final exam that we are taking as humanity. That's correct. Um, 
in the case of Japan and Germany, it was a war that ended it. Fortunately, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the case of Germany, nuclear weapons were not used. They, right. they were used in Japan. Right. Uh, some believe unnecessarily mm -hmm. uh, to end that war, but um, but uh, but at this point, as you say, we have. Uh, good relations with those countries, and right. those countries have not developed nuclear weapons. And Vietnam is an ally. Vietnam mm -hmm. is now becoming an ally, right, obviously. Exactly. Uh, yes. Well, they're they're a country we trade with, it and it right, to a great right. deal. In and any things case. certainly certainly changed over a very small on uh, time period on historical time scales. Well, and, and intractable and, um, problems such as the Northern Ireland Ireland question. At exactly. this point, that you know they're having some difficulty forming a parliament, but uh, they have. Uh, you know, they, peop, no one believed that you could have a treaty that would uh, cause the uh, forces in Northern Ireland to quit fighting, and and, right. uh, and that happened really relatively quickly once the will was there to do it. And I I think this kind of a treaty, if if we get enough countries to sign on to it, it only takes 50 to bring it into force. Mm -hmm. And as more and more countries join, and if perhaps some of our allies, our NATO allies, uh, begin to join this treaty. Then the momentum will be there for countries to uh, that have nuclear weapons to start negotiating to go to zero. During the Cold War, uh, we had so much pressure on President Reagan, and there was so ec so much economic pressure on the Soviet mm -hmm. Union uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev that we had two countries that were extremely hostile to one another mm -hmm. go within a few years to an agreement that eliminated one class of nuclear weapons and even contemplated going to zero in the Reykjavik talks. Right, right. And, and, and when you think about it, the, the enormous financial resources, uh, the scientific talent that's been wasted uh, over decades in the d development of nuclear weapons that could have been diverted to other humanitarian uses uh, to improve the health uh, of people worldwide, uh, to improve our environment, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just enormous. Uh, at one point, I read in the last five or so years that two-thirds of U.S. scientists were some way involved, even peripherally, peripherally in uh, defense contracts in some way. Uh, and that's a tremendous waste of, of, of scientific and brain resources that could be put to other uses. Uh, why do you think the Nobel Peace Prize uh, Committee chose um, to award uh, ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, the Peace Prize this year? Um, it was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, they weren't on anyone's uh, list of the, the uh, people who were handicapping it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the guy who's uh, position I'm taking, John Loretz uh, predicted it. He said, we need to be prepared to get this treaty because I think they're going to give it to us. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it was, I think we can really credit President Trump uh, more than anyone else with creating in a lot of people's minds uh, around the world concern that the United States uh, was not a responsible uh, holder of this nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. That the, the kinds of uh, cavalier threats that he makes toward other countries and the offhand manner in which he, he treats this, this uh, responsibility uh, sh has shaken a lot of people's faith that mutually assured destruction is a long-term mm -hmm. uh, smart strategy for surviving a, mm -hmm. a, you know, and not having a nuclear war. Right. And so I think it was that imperative that, uh, that caused the Nobel Committee to choose ICANN this year and the uh, Treaty to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And I think, think certainly actions by the president, by the current administration, have the world on edge, uh, but also have diminished our stature in the world, which will uh, impair our ability to sign trade agreements, uh, to negotiate other treaties, and it, it will likely take um, take decades to recover from this. Well, it, it, hopefully not. Well, we'll, you know, we'll see. Things can switch quickly, as we've seen both moving to Trump and, right. and as we saw during the Reagan era where the Reagan administration made a lot of very hostile sounds and then within That's a, a couple point. of years because of the pressure things, things change. That's a very good point. So you have been involved for many years uh, in campaigning against uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear power. Um, could you just briefly in the last minute or two that we've got um, tell us how you got interested in this and, and conclude by telling us what our viewers can do okay. um, to, to help? Well, here in the United States, uh, we are a little limited. I'll start with 
with that part of it uh, in the sense that we are one of the two nations that possess the majority of the nuclear weapons and we've used it as part of our foreign policy you know since the second world war mm -hmm. and uh, all of our military strategies are enmeshed with it mm -hmm. so i think it'll be very difficult uh, to convince our leadership will probably be one of the last countries to eliminate nuclear weapons mm -hmm. but there are things that we can do right now there are measures in congress that um would as i think you alluded to in your introduction would um prevent the president from just starting a nuclear war unprovoked right. um and uh passing one of those laws the marquee lou legislation um, and I believe uh, Representative Adam Smith from Washington is introducing something that's similar to that. Um, and uh, Senator Bob Corker, the Republican uh, Senator of the Foreign Relations Committee, held a hearing on that very topic. Uh, it was inconclusive, but if there's more pressure on the Republicans especially, since they control both houses, to take away this unnecessary right that the President currently has to start a war Right. You know, uh, Congress is supposed to hold that ultimate card, but uh, the first use of nuclear weapons unprovoked uh, with a, by an attack uh, upon us would be starting a war right. um, and should be unconstitutional. But everything helps. Uh, right. Writing op-eds, calling your legislators, exactly. going to protest. Uh, literally, uh, of, of when I think about all the work that I do in, in other social justice related areas and that you and many others have done, um, all of those would be rendered irrelevant if there was a nuclear war. Absolutely. Uh, that's why so I got, you asked me why I got yeah, involved please. in this issue. <laughs> that's it. Because this is the ultimate issue that, uh, this, this and climate change are the two ultimate issues right. that we face. Well, I'd like to learn more about your beginnings, and I'm going to have you back on the show <laughs> because we're out of time now um, to talk a little bit about nuclear power and nuclear waste and okay. Hanford and what's going on up there. But I'm, I'm very grateful. I wish you all the best in Boston. I know we'll see you back here in Portland. Um, thank you so much for coming on the program. Uh, my name is Martin Donahue. This has been Prescription for Justice. We look forward to seeing you on our next episode. Thank you.